it can be challenging is that if we're told that that's the only way and light, I mean, we're so multifaceted and life is not one way. It really, it's not one way. And so to be told that any part of us is the only way, um, I mean, it's just so limiting to who we really are. I mean, I just. Welcome to the Path to Wealth, the show about well-being, fulfillment and financial freedom. And I'm your host, Hannes Henschi. Welcome back to the Path to Wealth. Today we have Adapia Derico. And I was really looking forward to that conversation because we've previously had women emphasizing how important it is to be not fi only financially educated, but really making a difference. And she's leading $2 billion in real estate investments and a growth strategy in her form. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation because she has so many different platforms where she's emphasizing the importance of, you know, dialing into the intelligence of women when it comes to investing. So welcome to the show, Adapia. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So maybe you can give us a little bit of an idea. Where did your money mindset start? Because You know, for many women and actually men, I would say, it's it's not like second nature to dial into finance and become savvy investors. Um, where mm -hmm. did that journey start for you? Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, it's been um, it's been a difficult journey. It hasn't always been this way. I mean, that would be how I would start by saying it. I think where I'm at today with um how strong and how sure I am in it is really only a few years old. Um, and, and it might seem surprising, but in reality, um, even though I started very young, I started working in a bank when I was 18. Um, I was really interested in at that time what was what was coming up with mutual funds and the ability for everyday people to um you know to be able to have some wealth um so i grew up in i grew up in the 80s and the 90s um and so that there was these ideas you know wall street the movie and and these people making all this money and it was it was a different it was a different place it was a different time and then there were still very fixed ideas about women's roles and men's roles and careers and this and that. And I feel like around that time in the late nineties, um, some of that started, some of that started to, to change. Um, but throughout that time and, you know, I ended up moving to Europe for 11 years and I worked in uh, insurance. I've worked in banking. I worked in hedge funds. I worked kind of everywhere inside of me was still this battle between, um, what I knew I wanted to do and how I knew I wanted to make money and, and be independent. For me, it all came down to kind of independence and sovereignty and, and, and being empowered in myself. Um, and then at the same time, also still feeling uh, a sense of almost like guilt and shame for wanting it. So there was this constant inner battle inside of myself between um, So let's say wanting that and feeling it was bad. And I never really identified or really questioned what that was um, until, you know, until a few years ago, until like wisdom or life. I've, I've had also um, a pretty deep spiritual path over the past 10 years or so where I really started to understand how much of the ideas and the stories and the narratives are not mine and I carry them and I have the opportunity to choose different ones. And so, um, and so all of this to say that this, this mindset that I'm in, it's still a work in progress because I still catch myself sometimes where I feel, you know, like I might feel, um, that that's, that I still don't deserve it. Or, you know, I still don't ask for what I really want. Like there's still those moments, 
However, in the past few years and because of choices that I've made to, to say, you know what, like I'm going to choose differently. I'm going to, you know, throw the shame out, throw the guilt out, which is really hard to do because it's so much in the culture as well. And like we carry it, you know, we carry it and we see it. And um, and so I've, I've really landed in this place where um, if I don't do that for myself, uh, no one's going to do it for me. Uh, and the more I do it for myself, the more I feel I can also help others. And so that gives me the motivation to continue to stay strong in this, because at the end of the day, um, in men are given the message to be strong, to be powerful, to achieve more, to want more, you know, that, that money is great for them to get. Women still don't receive those messages from the places that, that matter, like when they're growing up young. And so we can't change that unless we change it in ourselves first. So that's really where I'm at with all of it. So when did you kind of realize that there was a, a narrative within you that you know, came maybe from social or family background and you realized that, you know, you wanted more, but it didn't feel right. When did you kind of realize that? I think I actually realized that um, during the pandemic. <laughs> so just a couple of years ago, because um, I realized that a lot of my friends, um, my, my female friends, and at that point, like I, um, I was doing women's circles in, in my home about once a month. And so we would get together and a lot of it was based on, on meditation and, and connecting on, on deeper levels on, let's say like a spiritual level of, um, you know, re really talking about, um, a more, more personal things. And I realized that in these, in these circles, which were so beautiful for me and so important for my growth, um, that we wouldn't really talk about work very, very lightly because that wasn't what it was about. But I realized that most people didn't know what I did for a living, which is private equity, real estate. And, and I, and I realized in a moment that there was a that I had never told anybody because I didn't want them to know because I didn't want them to judge me. And that is when I realized that that was still there, that I was afraid of their judgment about what I did for a living. And that's when I started. That's when I made a decision. And I said, well, that's just that's just silly. Like, why don't I, you know, what, what's the big deal about it? And so, um, and so even though it was a little bit hard because, you know, um, It's still hard to be vulnerable sometimes as you don't, you really don't know. Um, and, and then what happened is as I started to, you know, maybe bring it up, we would talk about different, different things with some of my friends. They were all so interested and so fascinated by what I, by what I do, not just in real estate, but I've, I've been an entrepreneur and venture and startup. So I understand. And, and I, and I do, I invest now and, um, in other startups, I'm an advisor. I do things that I really love. Um, and yeah. then, and so then they just all thought it was like the coolest thing. And mm -hmm. then I, and then, and then I realized how passionate <laughs> I was talking about it. And so it was a light bulb. Yeah. So I mean, it's, it's great to hear that they were curious, but um, were they also curious beyond just kind of being happy uh, that you shared your passion with them or, you know, did it open the door to a conversation about how you could potentially help them achieve their personal financial freedom? Did that curiosity come from them or was it? Yeah. Something? Yes. Um, sorry. Sometimes it's a little, the connection is a little slow. So, um, so sorry if I, um, if I jumped in there, but yeah, part, part of it was, um, specifically in having a conversation, um, with, with one woman who's actually my co-founder in women of wealth, which what we can talk about, what, um, in, in a moment, which is an organization, it's a mastermind and a, and really it's a nonprofit now, um, where we're really building a community, um, of women where we can talk about, um, not just finances, we talk about all kinds of things, but really centered on the topic of building, of building wealth. And so it was with her because Because she um, it owns her own insurance brokerage company um, because she yep. decided about a decade ago that she wanted to do insurance her own way. And she's very successful. And so she and I 
in our connection in this, um, we decided, first of all, we thought, well, why don't we just, why don't we just invite some women out for drinks here in, uh, in Los Angeles? And let's just talk about this. Let's talk about some of these things that, that, um, we think are really important. And, um, and then we were organizing that and then the pandemic happened. So we couldn't, we couldn't do that. So instead what happened is the two of us became our own masterminds. So we just, you know, we stayed connected. We talked about it. We talked about it a lot. And, um, and then, and then at a certain point around mid 2021, um, we said, you know, let's, let's finally do this. Maybe the world is opening up. And, um, and so we, we started putting in the work to, to start women of wealth, which we officially launched in, um, in February of this year. Nice. So maybe you, you speak a little bit out more about women of wealth and, you know, who, who it is for and, you know, who should join because I think it's a, it's a very interesting mastermind group. So maybe you can give us a little bit more insight on it. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, and so women of wealth is, it started as a mastermind and it's still, is centered on, on a mastermind, a small community of women. Um, we, there's women from all over, all over the U S so we meet virtually and we also do, um, live in person, maybe once a quarter. Cause it's nice to get, it's nice to meet in person and have those really in-person connections, but we have monthly meetings and accountability groups and we bring in guests and we, we, we really talk about like the full spectrum. It's everything from how to renegotiate your mortgage rate, um, to, you know, our, like our budgets, um, and all the way up to making some investments together, self-directed, um, but, you know, vetting investments together and, and making those investment decisions. And so, um, so it's really just focused almost on a, a live workshop of our own lives, of, of our own growth through wealth building and through finances. And, um, because it, what it really has been my experience. Um, and this comes through the real estate because with real estate investing, you really get significant, um, cash flow. So yeah. this idea that your money makes money for you. Right. Um, and most people don't know that this is possible, um, even though there are dividends in the stock market, but they're really not there. It's really not even close to being the same thing as what you can do with, yeah. with real estate, um, especially these days. Um, and, you know, especially in, in like the past, like 10, 12 years where it's not been about dividends, it's been about, you know, capital gains and, and growth. So um, so my experience in building my myself a portfolio that would create essentially another another salary or another financial like contributor to my life was even just for me, like eye opening. And I thought, well, shoot, like if I can do it, then, um, then this is really, this, this is really important. This is really important for, I mean, everyone to have a, another source of income. Um, and so that's really where it all, that's really where it all started. And, um, and so in the group, I mean, we, we, I mean, we talk about everything. We talk about cryptocurrency. We, we talk about like credit card, like, it's just like, and it's like a live workshopping of what everyone is going through and holding each other accountable and being inspired by one another and being able to support one another. Let's say if somebody's going through uh, a career change and they're negotiating and they're not sure how that feels or like it just, you know, what, whatever that is, um, that's what we do. It's, it's really, it's a really beautiful community. It's, it's been such a gift to my life. Yeah. I have one, one thought I always have is so how do you, encourage someone to take action towards all of what you're doing that has never been exposed to mm -hmm. it. How do you start that conversation? Hmm. Um, I don't know. I think, I think I, I don't really think about it. It's just, it's, it's just who I, I guess it's like who I am now. And, and so this is what I talk about it. As you know, like you, you see my content on LinkedIn, like this is like, um, th this is my Dharma. Like, this is my dharma, like my it. own overcoming yeah. of, you know, of my ideas of what I can do, can't do, should want, should not want. I mean, the whole, the whole thing. Um, 
And it is my dharma to have overcome so much and to reclaim a sense of power and wealth from the inside because the outside is just a reflection of the inside. So it's really a spiritual journey. Um, And then to share that and to share it in a way where in the world today, and it's been this way for a long time, um, there's also, there's also, and I've been, um, kind of guilty of this too, is, is this idea of wishful thinking that the world would be different than it is, that the monetary system or the financial system or the geopolitical system would be different and some, some kind of magical thinking. Um, because I have, I have such a sensitivity to humanity and, um, and, and, to, to, to collective suffering. I really feel it. And so it's been hard for me. Um, and, and yet at the same time there, the only way for any of that to change is for me to change it within myself first and then through my actions, right. Instead of wishing and hoping that some utopian miracle would happen or who knows what I was thinking. I don't know. I just, I just see so much pain and suffering and I don't want it there. Right. So what am I going to do about it ultimately? And so I know that I can change a lot through the actions that I can take. And I have more freedom, more, more power and more ability to change with more money. That is actually how it works. And this is why I want to shift more money into more people's hands because when more of us have more money and we use it in a certain way, especially investing in certain people, certain companies, like, I mean, there's a beautiful ecosystem with investing. Um, This is how we change the world because money and power do go together. And that was a, that was almost like, um, almost like an inner growth epiphany for me where I had to like face this little demon about like, I don't want it to be true. Um, but it is. And so if that's the game, then I'm going to play that game now. And that's really what happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it really seems in this world, if you want to change anything, it's really good to, ha- to have a bunch of money. You know, it's uh, with all the good yeah. intentions, um, people won't change a whole lot until or unless they either have a lot of money or power. And as you said, it kind of comes hand in hand. Yeah. So what, what are some of your yeah. personal goals? And it's not goals? bad, right? I, yeah, it's, I, don't, I don't think it's bad. Oh, I think sure. I, I don't think it's bad at all. Um, I think if you have yeah. the right intention on how to use money, at the end of the day, it only amplifies who you are inside of you. As you said, you know, it's inside out. Yeah, exactly. It's all about the intention. I'm so glad you said that because that was the piece that was actually the piece that helped me get very clear on, um, on it being okay for me. Um, because like I said, I always had that internal struggle. And then when I realized that my intentions have always been pure and true and good, then that was like a key that really unlocked my ability in myself to say, well, then I'm going to go for it. Why am I holding myself back from this? Because my intentions are good. And so if, if I'm doing this with good intentions and I can inspire or motivate or be a role model, whatever, it seems to be the case. It's not what I set out to do, but it seems to be that I'm able to really, um, turn something on in other people this way, um, then, then I'm going to go, then I'm going to go with it. Right. And so the more I have been doing that, the more I've been able to grow inside, outside, like in all of it. And, and it gives me, it gives me, I mean, it, like I said, it's such a gift in my life. It gives me so much to, to be able to do this. Um, and also when we're investing in people who have good intentions too, um, you know, investing is, is the highest form of charity. If I can facilitate someone to do what they want to do and grow a business and create economy and like their feed their family, their community, there's, I mean, there's so many incredible entrepreneurs and people, even in real estate, when you're investing in the right operators that have the right intentions with what they're doing with the, where these people, where people live, if we're doing multifamily or senior housing, I mean, there's, people involved. And so if you're investing in the right people with the right intentions, you are a change maker. And, and it's really exciting to, to do that. And then it just, like I said, like 
everything turns around. It feels like the universe just turns around and says, okay, um, let's do more of this. And, and so that's really been, um, just an incredible inside outside switch to see it switch from the inside and see the world truly this call and response mechanism that is the universe and or reality, whatever you want to call it, say, um, I see you and, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to give you more of this, um, this vibration or this choice or this, whatever it is, it's just something really changed. And it felt like the universe said yes <laughs> to this. Yeah. And so I'm, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm just in service to something so much bigger than me. So talking about intention, I think it's only natural to switch to intuition. And you said, you know, you felt like, You, you got the message and you actually wrote an entire book about intuition too, productive intuition. And um, maybe you can share your journey around that a little bit because it wasn't always intuitive to you, you know, and it was like a tuning in that had to happen with yourself so that you could, you know, feel it when things line up the way you just described it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's been a big, that's been the, the journey. I mean, I, productive intuition is really a function. That book is, is a function of the final part of what I would call, a, an over a decade long awakening of finding out who I really am. Um, by doing away with all the messages and all the narratives and, and everybody else's expectations and, um, just so, so much growth there, growth by letting go, if you will. Um, and then what I realized in this process that, that I went through that spanned everything from, uh, personal relationships to career, which was the really big one was a really big one for me in 2017, where I basically came undone as who I thought I was or who I thought I was supposed to be as a successful business person and completely came undone and, and really had to understand, um, if I can't be this, um, then who am I? And I learned a lot about myself and I, and I learned a lot about, about, yeah, about intuition because I was so focused on reason, which is not bad, you know, and this is really important. We were talking about this before we started recording about the holistic nature of life. Right. And so we get a lot of polarizing messages. It's either you're either intuitive or you are, you use reason, right? Uh, you're either objective or intuitive, your left brain, your right brain, you're an artist or you're a business person, like all of those messages. And we get those from such a young age. Um, and, and, and so it's up to us as adults, as we grow to, to choose what, what we want to be and really to undo all of these boxes and barriers that are really in our heads. And so the intuition piece, what came through for me as I was learning it was that, um, was that I am intuitive. Uh, everyone is, it's actually a part of our nature and we use it in so many different ways. And when you even hear very successful business people, um, they always talk about their intuition or like listening, like whether it's their gut or their heart. And, and then what I found as I was exploring this concept for myself, um, is that there's a lot of science that actually shows because the, in, this intuitive nature of ours really lives mostly in our body. And so there's um, incredible science that really helps us in our rational, you know, um, Cartesian ways of, of we need to think and we need to use our left brain a lot. And we do, but it's not everything. It's not everything. We have so many other functions and we have so much other intelligence. Um, we have, we have truly the intelligence of the body. We have, um, the neuroscience even shows that there's more, um, there's, there's more, um, essentially brain cells in our heart and our gut than there are in our brain. So the science, even just around that, um, is incredible. And it really woke me up to this idea that, you know, m maybe I don't only have to focus on my intellect as a measure of my value and my worth. And, and so the book really comes in and says, um, you are so much more 
so much more than uh, than the role or the the idea. And I think a lot of people are waking up to their intuition, but they don't have the language for it. And they don't maybe they don't think it's OK because it hasn't been OK. It really hasn't been OK for a long time. Yeah, I think especially coming from Germany, I don't think there it's a very intuitive culture where I grew up. It's, it definitely hasn't been OK. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, I was thinking about that when I was saying about the left and like, and because I've lived in Europe. And so I, I know, yeah. I know it's, it's all, you know, and it's not wrong. Um, what I do think can be, um, it can be challenging is that if we're told that that's the only way and light, I mean, we're so multifaceted and life is not one way. It really, it's not one way. And so to be told that any part of us is the only way, um, I mean, it's just so limiting to who we really are. I mean, I just like, when you think about it logically, like it doesn't actually make logical sense that it could, that it's only one way. It doesn't work well, for the, me. The interesting thing is that logic makes us believe it, uh, it can wrap itself around life but the truth is that logic is contained within life mm -hmm. and you know we think that we can dissect it logically in so many ways but uh, life is more like an actual experience and and uh If, if we remain within the realm of logic, we are missing the biggest part, all the Jews of life. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Logic is contained within all of life. I love that. That's beautiful. Yeah. And um, I mean, one of the things we also connected over recently is um, fasting, which I think is such an essential piece of realizing just that is, you know, that we we are more than what we think we are in in so many ways and that you know um, our body can sustain different things that uh, culturally or socially might not be acceptable because i think it's very funny when people get on an airplane for eight hours they they literally think they're going to die if they don't get food on the plane and um right. and, and i think you you and me um in as a spiritual practice and also just to kind of rejuvenate our system have gone through this experience and yeah maybe you can share a little bit about what your recent fasting experience was like yeah it, it's true um Again, it goes back to what we believe, these, these ideas, these thoughts that, oh, if I don't eat, then something I'm going to feel bad. And, and yeah, maybe the stomach, the stomach is feel like rumbles. And we think that, th that that's a bad thing when in reality, it's just, it's just like a physical sensation. Um, and this is where I find the mind very tricky and also either uh, useful or just, or just like a horrible, horrible little animal, um, that, that, that freaks out essentially. I mean, what I understood, and this was this fast that I did. So I did a 30 day cleanse. I did a 21 day pre fast of eating very clean, um, very, very, very clean and slowly taking things out because, um, I didn't want, um, I wanted the fast, the full seven day green juice, green juice and water only fast to be, um, um, not as easy as possible, but basically I, I didn't want no to, to have too strong of a reaction. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to have too strong of a reaction when I took everything else. So I did it slowly. And that was also a form of self care for me because I have a tendency in my past to, um, to be, to, to basically be like OCD or just like very, um, I get fixated on things and, and then I, it just, it's like a bad thing for me. Like I've been, um, I've been anorexic and I have body dysmorphia. So I know myself, I know how my mind operates. So I gave myself a pre fast, which in and of itself was incredible. And then I did a juice fast. It was my first juice fast ever that I did for seven days. And, um, it was actually 
it was actually really, I mean, like it wasn't that hard. Like my body wasn't even that hungry. I didn't even miss coffee, which I thought I would. That was the last thing. I waited until two days before to That's stop the coffee. Italian I inside. did. Cause I, and I tried, it is, I know I tried really hard to convince the, I was working with a coach to convince her that I could do coffee alternatives. And, and I watched my, my mind, I watched this little beast try really hard to, um, either sabotage it or to find some crutch to something that it wanted comfort. It wanted some form of comfort. And so my first three days were, were fabulous. And normally the first three days, uh, as I've understood it, are the most, are the most difficult, are, um, you know, the ones where you feel angry and nasty. Mine were fine. So I thought I was in the clear. And I was like, oh, this is great. Look at me. I'm doing so good. And then on day four is when all the emotional stuff started started to come up it was day four and day five um and it just and I've been through I do my work I do my personal work I'm very familiar with it luckily and so I knew what was going on I knew that it was emotional I knew that it was the shadow work I knew that I was like looking at things about myself that I didn't want to look at because with fasting, um, food is just another distraction that we use to not look inside at what's really going on that might be going on with ourselves or, you know, life is showing us something we don't want to look at. And so day four and day five were really challenging. Um, and, um, and then after that, the, the last two days were, um, you know, they, they were they were a little they, they were fine. But those two days were really the kind of like peak um, peak moment of of challenge um, of challenge for me. Yeah. So what 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 would you say was one of the biggest challenges you experienced there? Um, it was. It was like, it was really themed around, um, where I'm not pushing, I guess, not that I want to push myself, but where I'm backing off of where I was backing off of needing to, um, push myself in a direction of discomfort. I mean, let's be honest, nobody likes discomfort. Like it just, we just don't. Um, yeah. And there was, there's some, there's some things in my life that I just had to like kind of sit down and, and, and like really work hard at, which is, which I'm, and here's the thing, this is, I'm going to walk you through my mind. So my mind says, you're so busy, you're doing so many different things. Um, you don't have time to really learn this thing in depth. That's really important. Or, you know, that like you're, you're. When things are easy for me, I fly through them, right? I love it. I'm like, a lot of things come easy. The things that are really challenging for me, I try really hard not to do because, you know, I don't want to play to my weak, like I play to my strengths, but at the same time, there's some things I just, I just have to sit down and do the, the do the difficult thing. Um, so, so that I grow and I didn't yeah. want to do this difficult thing. And it was like, it was playing out in different ways in my life. So that came up in a really like in a really big way for me. Um, and it's a little bit complex to get into, but suffice it to say that I realized what this, what this was and, um, and that in a way I use food and this, I kind of already knew, but like I will use food to, um, distract myself from doing focused work. Let's say like if I have to do focused work, I will get up and I will go snack on something instead of just yeah. sitting my butt down and doing this thing and getting in that zone and getting focused because like my husband, for example, he, I, I don't even know how he does it. He can sit and be focused for eight hours uh, and I can't do it for eight minutes. And so it's a very different personality type, but, um, but you know, so like, so that really, so that really came up. Um, interestingly though, my body, 
I mean, I, I had a little bit of weakness, but I was drinking like I was drinking two liters of green juice a day. So I wasn't doing the like I wasn't doing the strong, the strong fast again, because I know my mind and I and I know that 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 little anorexic part of me. And I didn't want to trigger that. I wanted to feel um, that I wasn't depriving myself, essentially. Yeah. And so I had so much energy. I had so much energy. I mean, I did. I wasn't hungry. Um, I mean, I felt hunger sometimes, but it wasn't such a bad thing. But my energy levels, my mood, um, my skin, like, I mean, I just have never experienced such vibrant health as when I was on this fast. That's great. And I, and I mean, you, you also came out of it and you, you posted a picture of yourself and it looked just like vibrant, you know, your skin was glowing and you were glowing and it, it was really reflected. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, coming out of it too, I did have this like little bit of, of fear. I thought if I start eating again, like this, like, I don't want to, I want to keep this. And so I've been, um, so that's been a, that's been like a thought in my mind lately of of um, like as I came out of that, because, you know, be, the juicing kept me in that state, really, for the for the most part. And then when you go back to eating again and, um, you know, it, it, it's a little I've been very I've been relatively clean. But, for example, I just came back from a, a work trip where it wasn't possible to always like eat really clean. And so I have this yeah. like the mind again comes in yeah. and 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 it's it's a it's this little it's a constant battle with this thing, this little beast that um that that's always there trying to, I don't know, like, I don't know if it's a sabotage thing, but I've been working on, um, you know, I actually maintained, I have a juice for breakfast now, actually still. I've, I loved nice. it so much that I still do like, I try to like a green juice for, for breakfast. Um, so it's been a challenge to get back to the food and get back to like a more normal cadence of life and food and eating, um, and managing the, I felt so good. I want to stay like this, but it's also not sustainable to, to only be juicing all, you know, all the time. Yeah. That's probably not a thing for the entire year. But uh, especially work trips, I always find it rather challenging, you know, then usually meeting places tend to be around food that's less desirable. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. And, and then I think it becomes really important to be able to state certain things like I mean I have Crohn's disease so it, it's been like this since I was 16 where I'm you know I'm able to say listen I cannot eat this food like I just can't do this and where that was um kind of not okay all of those years ago to to say um now especially in California I mean you can modify everything in California and you can you know you can you can order basically, you know, almost anywhere like they'll, they're like, okay, uh, all the modifications that, that you want, you can get those. Um, but it's still, you know, it's still not the same, um, as one, like you're able to, to, to like eat your really clean food, um, at home, yeah. but it's important to be able to say like, no, I won't eat this. Or I found it really helpful to tell people right off the bat, um, especially when I was fasting, I'm doing this fast. And so by telling other people, I couldn't break, I, like they would almost hold me accountable. So saying it to somebody makes sure that, that they, um, I don't know how to say this, but basically like by saying it, I yeah, couldn't, like, I couldn't do different. Step back. <laughs> yeah. You, you have to align with the words, you know, you promised it to the public. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, so exactly, you, exactly. I promised it to the public. How, how do you handle accountability at the Women of Wealth? Yeah, so accountability, the easiest way to do accountability for us is to have um, the smaller groups that meet more frequently. And then those smaller groups set their own agenda for every meeting or maybe what they're working on or maybe what they want to learn for. And we do that quarterly. And so we switch the groups up quarterly so that everybody can get to know one another. Um, and then I think, again, it, it comes down to naming it like saying the thing, um, because as long as it's in our heads, 
we always have an escape route. If we don't say it out loud, there's always a way out of it because we can talk ourselves out of something because nobody knows. Um, but when somebody knows, right, then, um, then it's a little harder. And I think this is maybe true, maybe, maybe for me personally, or, or just for, for women, it's also a little, it's also a big personal growth to ask for support. Um, is this really, you know, women have this tendency, um, especially when we're ambitious or like in work or, I mean, just to really prove ourselves very independently, even though we're extremely nurturing, but when it comes to like our growth or our thing, like our needs, we don't ask for what we need. We don't ask for support. And, and so there's a lot of personal growth that goes into it. So the accountability at Women of Wealth really starts with being able to ask for support. And, and so the person receiving that request or that they know when they're in that accountability group or the whole group is that um, we're here to support one another. So we're asking for support and we're giving support. And so, um, you know, I also make it a point to check in with people that I might not have seen active very much or just how they're how are they doing. So we check in with one another because life gets really busy and we just want to make sure that that we all know that we have that we have each other to um, to turn to, as opposed to um, maybe more formal accountability. Um, but really, the groups and and the check ins and and um, that's really how that's really how we do it. Just making sure there's like a little a touch point there for everybody to um, um, to to know and to ask for the support that they need and and we're all willing to give it that's the thing like we're all so willing to give the support and and to help somebody yeah. be accountable but until someone asks we nobody i mean like somebody has to ask for it in order for for somebody else to give it yeah there's no mind reading going on you have to at least word it once and speak it out loud <laughs> So for, for the women that, you know, that are listening or that the women that want to get started, you know, not only on the financial journey, but taking it to the next level, stepping out of the narrative that they might have experienced culturally, where do you think they can find the right resources or where, where do they get started to, to kind of boil it down for themselves, dissect what is narrative that was catered to them culturally or from the family and kind of build their own narrative in the noise? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, there's so many resources. I think that, I think we all know to some, I think we all know to some degree that we have these narratives and, um, and these ideas, um, you know, in, in my actually in, in my book, at the end of every chapter, I have self-reflection questions and I have other resources and like where we can go deeper and learn because it's 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 it can be as complex as complex and as deep as you want. And it can also be as simple as um, journaling. The self-reflection is really you don't need anybody to do that. Um, but just like the fasting, I wouldn't have done it if I didn't have a coach. So mm -hmm. it helps to have somebody there for that, that accountability. Right. Yeah. Um, and so even if it is, um, you know, I find that self-reflection just for myself with like asking myself the questions and, um, and, and like doing the journaling. And sometimes you think, well, you know, like, what are those questions? And so the fastest way for me that I found to do it is if there's something that's not feeling right for me, that's not going well, that's bothering me, um, that I have to sit and ask and literally ask myself, like, what is this? And so I either write it out because that's just a process or in meditation or if I'm on a walk, like I just process it in the back of my mind until I can start to get clarity on what that is. But I have to ask myself, I'm the only one with the answer to that question. Yeah. And then through the reflection and through the contemplation and even through the writing, it's so powerful. You start to see, oh, essentially I believe this. Th and, and this thought is creating this emotion 
And this emotion is kind of fueling that thought, which makes me take an action because it's enough to watch the thoughts in our head. Like yeah. the conversation you're having with that person that you're angry at, that you're just having it in your own head, that's enough to notice what is going on there. But then you have to be really honest with yourself. Super honest. This is so hard. And, the and like, hard, yeah. and like, yeah. And you just have to be honest with yourself and, and like, why am I angry at that person? I'm blaming them for something, but like, where is it? Where is, where am I responsible for some of this? Like, where is it me? Because it's so much easier to say this person did this to me and that person, you know, the world did this and men did that and all this kind of stuff. But where is it me? And then where can I make a different choice? Where can I take even a small action? And, and to be so brutally honest with ourselves, um, really helps us see where we can ultimately make the change because nobody else is going to change. So it's a big, deep process. It's like the fasting. It's like the, what, uh, I can't eat the thing to make me distracted from the actual thing that's bothering me. <laughs> and so it's, it's that, but almost, almost constantly, but that's the way to do it. Um, and a lot of it com will come through in meditation where you watch your thoughts. Um, and that's a really good place to start. And then there are, oh my gosh, there's so many books and there are so many people that give talks and, you know, they, they, they make a living like doing this or working with a coach, honestly, like coaches are really good at that accountability piece of, of helping you with the self-reflection um, and, and questioning yourself. If you had to recommend one book to start with, which one would be the book? Oh, for, um, like for self-reflection purposes. Feel free to recommend your own one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, th I mean, I think my book is really good for people who are like, uh, don't want to read a spiritual book because I really wrote it for people like that are in career, in business, like it's, it, it has all of that, but it's really written for people who don't really resonate with the overly spiritual, um, types of books out there. And I understand that there's some stigma yeah. there. I certainly had that as well, where I just like, I don't want to look at that. Um, but, and then another person, and she's been doing this for years. Um, uh, and, and her work is, is based on self-reflection. Her name is Byron Katie. Um, uh, yeah. so, and her book yeah. is called the work. And yeah. so she has this whole process and she's dedicated her life and her career to this specifically. Um, so that's a methodology, um, that's a, that's a methodology or you can, so that would be another one for somebody who, who just really wants a direct process. There's that. And my book will take you more into every facet of self-reflection, the body, the emotions, the mind, um, the heart. Uh, and, and it's, it's a, it's maybe a little more holistic. Yeah. So one of my favorite questions, and it's usually my wrap up question is, um, What does it mean to you to live a life well lived? Mm. Well, that's such a beautiful question. Um, I think for me to live a life well lived, I want to feel like I was able to really explore um, everything that is what I would consider my potential, like to live a life well lived is I've done my best to, to do my best to really, to, to pull out and take action on the thing that is inside of me that drives me. And I still haven't quite gotten to what that is. It's just a really strong feeling that just pushes me constantly. Um, And so for me, my life well lived means that I've, I feel like I've, I've done the work I came to do and that I've, I've been the person that has done her utmost to understand how to live a, to live a life that feels full 
um, across all the spectrums. Um, so yeah. work and, and, and career and family and, and all of those things. So I want to feel like I didn't hold anything back and that I was able to explore who I am, why I'm here, uh, and to do something about it. I love that. I love that. It was a great answer. Well, Adapia, thank you so much for your time. Where can people connect with you? Where can they find out more about you or your book? Yeah. Um, so the easiest place to connect with me is on LinkedIn. Um, I love connecting with people on LinkedIn. That's the platform that I use that I use the most. Um, and then my book is available anywhere that the books are available. So Amazon, um, it's it's distributed um, all over. Uh, it's only in English, but you can get it in, in Europe. I know a lot of people that have bought it there as well. So um, you can look up Productive Intuition on Amazon or uh, Barnes and Nobles, like all, all of those places. But come and find me on, on LinkedIn. I share the, I share almost daily. I'm on there every day. So I love connecting with people there. Nice, nice. I enjoyed this conversation so much. Thank you again, you know, for sharing your personal story and, you know, the depth of your fasting experience and everything. And yeah, just uh, for being you. Thanks for having me. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for joining us at The Path to Wealth. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Check out our upcoming guests and be sure to share it with all your friends and family that want to take their life to the next level of wealth.